I was 10 when I first stared death in the face, and 11 when I earned a Purple Heart. I was wounded in battle, in a war I was drafted into, that I didn't even know existed, and not one I wanted to fight. This wasn't a war in Afghanistan or Iraq. This is a war fought right here at home, where the enemy attacks from inside you, and the weapons are prescribed by doctors. I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 10. I'd injured my hip playing soccer, and it didn't get better. We saw an orthopedist, and I was treated for a broken growth plate on my hip. The pain got worse over the course of the fall until it was so bad that it kept me up at night, and I could barely walk. By Thanksgiving, it was clear I needed a scan. I had gone from walking to crutches to a wheelchair in three days. It was also at this point that I learned I was violently allergic to narcotics, which is not the best thing to be allergic to when you're facing a bone cancer diagnosis, but oh well. <laughs> when the scans came back, I knew it must have been bad because we were sent immediately to a top children's hospital to see both orthopedics and oncology. I was admitted for a week of surgery, tests, scans, diagnosis, and my first round of chemotherapy. I was diagnosed with pelvic Ewing sarcoma, which is a pediatric bone cancer. My tumor was the size of a melon, and it took up my entire hip and went down into my leg. For the next 10 months, I lived in the hospital every other week for many rounds of inpatient chemo and surgeries. For my cancer, the chemo is administered over a few days. So I would check in the clinic on Monday morning and then go home Friday night for a week while I waited for the chemo to kill all of the fast-growing cells in my body. In between rounds, I would be in for clinics, counts, blood transfusions, and neutropenic fevers. Chemo, or poison, as I called it, was the chemical weapon doctors had available for my war. One chemo was actually derived from mustard gas. As I lay there in my hospital bed for my first round of chemo, the nurse came in with what looked like a hazmat suit, with gown, gloves, and mask. I asked her why she had all that protective gear on as she put a large red syringe, partially covered into, in a garbage bag, onto one of the pumps on my IV pole. And without looking up from her work, she looked at me, and, without looking up, she looked at me, right? She said, because this can't come into contact with human skin. Oh, really? <laughs> but you're pumping it into my body? I thought that there was something seriously wrong with this image of pumping toxic chemicals into a growing child. But it was my best chance for survival. From the start, the doctors told me they would likely need to amputate a quarter of my body, from the hip down on one side. Kind of an unimaginable concept for a 10-year-old, or anyone, for that matter. But luckily, after six rounds of chemo, my tumor had shrunken enough that my surgeon could save my leg. I had a hemipelvectomy to remove my hip, tumor, and any other tissue that had been infiltrated by the cancer. I was in a spica cast for six weeks, and then a spica brace for another eight. I spent the summer between fifth and sixth grade learning how to walk without a hip. After 14 rounds of chemo, I finished my cancer treatments, quite literally earning a Purple Heart. It was awarded to me by my hospital through a national nonprofit program for cancer kids called Beads of Courage. And you get to add a Purple Heart when you get to the end of your cancer treatments. The bad news was my post-treatment scans were not clear. There were areas of concern on my femoral head and tailbone. I knew that this cancer was very aggressive, and that if it came back, there were no treatment options. So with my femoral head and tailbone lighting up, my doctors told me that it would be my last summer, and that my family should pack up and go on our last family vacation. <laughs> that was nine years ago, and here I am. I proved them wrong. <laughs> I'm not out of the woods yet. For Ewing sarcoma, the remission period is 10 years, which means I have to wait until I'm 21 to call myself a survivor. There's also a 50% 50 recurrence rate, and if it does, there's no known cure. But I'm just one year away. When I was diagnosed, I had no idea at the time just how big our battalion of soldiers was. I was told childhood cancer was rare and felt there weren't many in our army. But at the time of my diagnosis, there were 40,000 children in the United States battling the same battle for their lives, and a million children worldwide. 40, 
5,000 other soldiers fighting alongside me, with 16,000 new recruits drafted each year. Some were at war for several years. This didn't just seem rare and insignificant to me. Currently in the US, one in every 285 kids is diagnosed with cancer, and that incidence rate increases by 6% every year. Some of these child soldiers have no weapons to fight with. When kids in underdeveloped nations are diagnosed with cancer, they are often sent home to die because they don't have access to the treatments we have. For those of us in the United States and other developed nations, we're the lucky ones. We have treatment facilities, drugs, radiation, and surgeries available to us. What we have here isn't enough, but at least we have options so that we can fight for the chance to grow up. Treatment protocols for cancers vary by each type, but in general it takes about 10 months to fight solid tumors, and up to three years for some forms of leukemia. For me, I had 14 rounds of inpatient chemo and some surgeries. What I saw was lots of little bald kids riding their RV poles down the hallway, or being pulled in red wagons with their IV poles in tow. Three of my friends, Maya, Tori, and Sammy, would always bring their American girl dolls to the hospital and have playdates in each other's rooms. We buried Maya in 2014, after her fifth cancer battle. She was nine years old. It was surreal to me to see these little kids acting as normal as they could, all while enduring brutal chemo regimens, radiation sessions, and devastating surgeries. They should have been on the playground at school, or in their own little beds at night, instead of living in the hospital, having tubes of toxic chemicals pumped into them from beeping machines. A day for me wasn't too bad. I had Xbox. I took it one day at a time, one milestone at a time, embraced every breath as a gift, and took every opportunity that I could to speak out about childhood cancer and raise research funds for my hospital. I planned to survive. We all did. We had futures ahead of us. What really changed things for me was when I learned that our soldiers were dying. Here I was, about nine rounds in, in my big blue body cast, and the hospital gets very quiet after about 8 p.m. It's a children's hospital after all, kids need to sleep. And my mom and I had just finished watching a movie. It was probably 11.30, we were getting ready for bed. And all of a sudden there was a break in the silence. A crash and a scream. And when you're on an oncology floor, those noises really only mean one thing. Michael was three years old. I realized that night that Michael would never grow up he would never graduate high school, he would never get married, he would never have children. And the worst part is that no one really knew. The world did not stop to remember Michael. It didn't make the news. His loss did not cause corporations to rethink their corporate giving structures. Even people on the same oncology floor didn't know Michael died. I had to do something. I had learned about the incidence rates, the treatment protocols and their shortcomings, the funding gap, and the truth behind survivorship rates. So I turned to my mom and I said, someone really needs to make some noise about this. And she turned back and said, yeah, you're right, someone really does. And after a few more seconds, she realized that I wanted to be that somebody. And I laid out my whole plan for starting a foundation for pediatric cancer research. I wanted to get on the national talk circuit to educate people about childhood cancer and how urgent the cause is. I wanted to have headlining musicians do music benefit concerts for pediatric cancer research. And thankfully, I have the world's best mom. So she turned back to me and said, OK, let's do it. Of course, I had to finish my own cancer battle first before I could wage war against childhood cancer as a whole. So I finished my treatments over the summer and officially incorporated Make Some Noise, Cure Kids Cancer on September 24th, 2009. From there, we hit the ground running. We had our first funders the next day, a car wash at the local church with the live band, of course. And in January 2010, we had our kickoff gala, raising $110,000 in one night. By March, we released our first awareness video called One in 320, which was the cancer incidence rate in children at the time. And I outline my story on behalf of the children who cannot, in an effort to describe how urgent this cause is. 
in the next few years, we incorporated chapters in Seattle, Denver, Boston, and Western New York, as well as creating new fundraisers and campaigns to further the cause. We created the Heroes Run, in which participants can earn the privilege of wearing a gold cape to show their heroism for kids' cancer by raising $100 on their sponsorship page. We renamed our annual gala Noise Night and encouraged people around the country to host their own Noise Night events around the country so that we can be making the most noise possible. A large portion of our funds come from grassroots events, like school fundraisers and church collections, etc. By the time I was 18, we had raised $2 million for pediatric cancer research. And the type of research that we fund depends on the kind of cancer, because each pediatric cancer is at a different place in their research advancement. So for tumors that are a little further behind, we fund basic science, which would be like identifying the gene that triggers the tumor, or creating a tumor bank so that researchers can better understand how it behaves. We try and look for specific translational research studies for cancers that are further along. We both look at preclinical and clinical work. That well, would be things like bypassing the blood-brain blood barrier for brain tumors, or immunotherapy trials, and other amazing work like that. We try and move research to the next level so that we can be saving more lives, because that's what's important. However, with the NIH budget continuing to shrink, researchers are spending up to 75% of their time just trying to get the money to do their research. We can't allow our progress in research to stagnate or even evaporate due to a budget issue. This is where foundations like Make Some Noise come in. We bridge the funding gap. We make sure that these researchers have the resources they need to conduct their amazing work and that we can save more lives, not only save them, but save them more effectively with less long-term side effects. Perhaps my favorite project with Make Some Noise is called the National Angel Quilt. The idea was conceived by my mom during a period where we had lost four friends in two weeks. Driving home from one of the funerals, my mom was desperately searching for a way to honor these children and show that they're not just numbers on a piece of paper. These are real children that would have grown up to become doctors, teachers, musicians, scientists, and leaders. Who knows who we've lost already? Who will lose tomorrow or next week? So she thought about the AIDS quilt and how impactful that was on changing the country's perspective on AIDS and came up with the idea of an organized memory quilt for childhood cancer victims. As it is right now, any childhood cancer victim who has earned their angel wings due to their battle is eligible to be on the quilt. And due to HIPAA laws, we can't find them ourselves, of course, so we <laughs> rely on family members to submit their loved ones to the quilt. Beyond Make Some Noise, the foundation is a founding member of the Coalition Against Childhood Cancer, which is a coalition of pediatric cancer foundations that support family support, uh, research, advocacy, awareness, and, uh, and things like that. And what we've been able to do through the coalition is work with many other foundations to create a first-of-its-kind research conference where all of the stakeholders in childhood cancer are brought together. The foundations, the researchers, pharmaceutical companies, government regulators. Typically, these conferences are just the researchers or just pharmaceutical companies, what have you. We brought everyone together for the first time. Today, we continue our work with CAC2, the coalition, and uh, on our own. I won't stop making noise until these cures are found. I've lost too many friends, and I keep losing more. But making noise can be applied to many more things besides cancer research. When you're faced with adversity or injustice, it empowers you to be the voice, to bear witness and share it with the world. In post-9-11 New York, the New York Metro Transit Authority came up with the slogan, if you see something, say something. This was done in a call to action plea so that the citizens could help the police protect the people. Cities are huge, and there just aren't enough police to see everything. So they were relying on lay people to look for suspicious behavior or unattended bags and things like that. And what they were doing, in effect, is educating everyone that their voice can change the world. Your voice can save a trainload of passengers. Your voice 
can save a local landmark from demolition, help save an endangered species, change laws. Just look at Florida today. A few enraged high school students have been able to change gun laws in Florida and possibly change national laws. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. An 11-year-old can start a foundation for pediatric cancer research, or some raging grannies can fight for your social services. Too often, I see people faced with adversity, and they sit and feel sorry for themselves. And I always ask, why? If you're alive, act it. Change can come in any size, and its impact can be profound. All you need is to grab your passion, use your brain, and fight with everything you have until change is made. And then keep fighting. Thank you, and thank you to the University of Rochester TEDx team for this amazing event.